righty, hold on. And just checking to see, and we are on the way to being live. There are three screens up. And we are live on YouTube. We are live on YouTube for part, and we are live on Facebook for part two of our four part series. Mm -hmm. I'm excited to get. Seems like your sound went off for a moment. So I understand what you're saying. You're start you're excited to get started. I didn't hear you though. Your sound went off. I know that one of the things that she must be saying at this time when she as she fixes her sound is that um she's she's saying dua to you all for coming in, right? I see the numbers going up. Come on in, come on in. Looking forward to a really interesting conversation tonight. Come on in. And I even see that some folks are putting their names in. Um, Destiny Willis says that their name is Kepra Ank Netter. Love you, family. Mur to you too. Ank and Ma'at family, so many. Um, folks whose names I recognize, folks who are full members of the Shrine of Ma'at. I see Sunet Cheryl is there. Sunet Chandra is there. I see Sunet Cortia there. There are members who are jumping in, both on Facebook and on YouTube. Um, it's wonderful to see you all, Ank and Ma'at. Wonderful, wonderful to see you all. Um, and uh, we're going to have a, a powerful conversation about comedic history. Um, obviously, comedic history is one of those areas that so many folks are not familiar with. If you ask people about uh, this great nation, they certainly would be more familiar with the word Egypt. And I think it's so interesting that the term Egypt is not a term that anyone that lived during that time would have used, right? It's a derivation of a, a, a Greek attempt to speak the name of one of Kemet's most popular cities. That city was um, known as Hetkapata, Hetkapata, um, and it really was more than the name for the city. It's the name for um, the 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 temple that was there, um, the house of the soul of Pata. And as they tried to speak Het Kapata, it became Aguptos. And eventually, they the name that was more familiar was then um, uh, Egypt. And so, so many more people would probably know this great nation by the name Egypt. So if you don't even know the name of the nation, how can we expect you to be able to talk about the powerful periods in this three millennia um, long a legacy of these folks. It is in a really, really powerful, powerful period. And I'm looking forward to talk much more about it tonight. I think we can hear you now. Can you guys hear me? Yes, we can. And I'm here and great. Good. Since we've got the hymn netter in Tepe and the host of the show, on at the same time. Yep. <laughs> that's, that's that's a good that's a good that's start. A, that's a good start. That's a good start. That's how it's going to be, right? That's a good start. So, um, welcome welcome to Tuesday Talk for part two of this four part series on the four golden eras of Kemet. And I caught the tail end of what Intepi Jabari was discussing. If you don't know the name, how can you study it? It is so important for everyone to do their own research on Kemet and also the rest of Africa, because we all need to know who we are. Why do we need to know who we are? We need to know who we are in general, so we know how to conduct our lives on a second by second basis, 
on a daily basis, monthly basis, how to live our lives. You know, it's like when you're out in public and you see somebody acting a fool and you're like, mm, his mama didn't raise him right or something along those lines. We need to reclaim our culture at many levels, you know. And the other reason why I asked Jabari if he could do this series is because I remember, actually, it was at a meeting for the uh, dessert club. Um, Jabari, what's the other what's the other name of it again? African, African Genesis. Genesis Institute. Right, African Genesis Institute. Yep. And we were we were in Philadelphia. This was way before COVID. And one of the women in the audience said, in terms of reading African history, she was just like, "Where where would I even start?" Right. And I know a lot of us feel intimidated by the process of starting because there's so much. And yes, there's so much. However, these four uh, Tuesday talks are like four pillars to provide a skeletal structure to give you a basic foundational understanding. And then you can continue on with your study and fill in the blanks and, it, and then and there's structure to it so you won't feel so overwhelmed, okay? The good thing about this is it's recorded. It's up on, on YouTube. You'll be able to go back and watch it and study from this until you're able to do other study and move forward. So I really hope you take advantage of this. So, Mr. Hit, Mr. <laughs> Him Netter and Tepe, Jabari Osaze, do you remember where you left off? Of course. I'm yes. talking about um, four critical periods. So you should know that um, we've had one session prior, right? Which means that yes. it's now time to talk about um, uh, uh, the second period. And so that's the way that I would um, describe it. I'm going to talk to you. I'm going to uh, make it clear where we left off, just so you know. Okay. Um, uh, we, as in talking about these periods, I think that we should recognize that um, in some ways it can be challenging studying all um, uh, uh, all of the 3,000 years plus of comedic history, right? You could certainly go all the way back 9,000 years BCE and talk about Kemet, right? Far pre-dynastic Kemet. Um, but I, I think that as you're trying to understand how Kemet works, one of the best things that you can do is you can simply say, well, um, how do I understand the nature of the 3,000 years? Right. The I had to encapsulate the most important periods of Kemet. How do I do that? And so that's the reason why we have described this as the four critical errors of Kemet. This is a term that I've used in my book, Seven Little White Lies, A Conspiracy to Destroy the Black Self-Image. And so that's really the direction that I think we ought to go so we can understand the nature of Kemet. One of the other reasons why we should try to understand the nature of Kemet is because as the most powerful nation in the region for such a long period of time, you know what happens to important cities, even in the United States. Think of it that way. Mm -hmm. When you have an important, powerful, opulent city, a cosmopolitan city, what ends up happening? People from other areas move in. We right. should expect this, right? That's kind of what happens with civilizations and with cities, even today. And so sometimes when we are talking about the African nature of Kemet, some mm -hmm. of the people that would like to misrepresent the African nature, sometimes will look for someone and say, well, this person wasn't African. They might yes. not be important. We might not know where they were, like, for example, what city, what area they were near. We don't even sometimes know what period, what time it's from. So when they do that, they're being disingenuous. That's right. They're being disingenuous. Understanding these four critical periods helps you understand comedic history. And also it helps you recognize that the comedic, um, that, that ancient Kemet was certainly an African um, nation. That's why this is important. That's right. That's why this is important. So let's take a look at these, um, this period. 
so that you're really clear what periods we're referring to. I'm going to share my screen for a second. And you'll also be able to see the first era that we talked about. So as we look at these four eras, we're talking about the period in which Kemet becomes a great powerful nation. That would have to be when it was re when it was unified under that great king known as King Namr. That's what we talked about last week, last last time, last month. Right. right. We talked about when Namr unified Kemet. And in fact, after this period, then we enter what is usually called dynastic Kemet. And so you might say, well, what does that mean, Jabari? Some of you have studied this, right? What is a dynasty? Tell us what a dynasty is in the chat. Tell us what a dynasty is in the chat. We've so never I, studied it. I don't know. I'm joking. <laughs> you know you should know. So <laughs> it's a joke. I, I, want, I want them to tell us what they know of what a dynasty is. And as we look at this, take a look at this. You're seeing that dynastic Kemet starts under Namr. And I want to say something else about Namr. I find it so interesting that he is so important because he is the king that essentially puts the whole thing together. But almost no one has ever seen this image of him. The only image that they might have seen is the image on that device called the palette of Namr. So take a look at that. Take a look at that. This image is clearly African. This man that creates dynastic Kemet is clearly an African. So we have a few answers. We see, question me says, a ruling family line. That's certainly part of the answer, absolutely. And Sinet Tisha says, I think Tisha is the, the name that we're looking for, a period of time that was ruled by a certain family. That's another way to look at it. And mm -hmm. then, Senator says, a group of rulers based on family ties and kingship. Those are good answers. Of course, Senator and, and a few others are ringers, right? What do I mean when, they, when I say they're ringers? Clearly, these are folks who um, have studied the history. And Senator is even in my course, um, Three Millennia of Excellence, that is actually ending next week. It's, it's a history of um, ancient Kemet. And so clearly you should understand that this is both a period of time and it's a period of time that is designated by a group of rulers that are related in some form. Now, those are the general rules for how you create a dynasty, but recognize that there are also exceptions. Sometimes people still call something a dynasty, even though it violates some of those rules to some um, in some period, okay? Mm -hmm. That's very important. So we talked last time about Namr, this ruler that marches north, coming from further into Africa, and then puts the darn nation together. He's the guy that did it. Very important for us to recognize that period of time, at the, occurring at around 3100 BCE. Now, when I say 3100 BCE, how long ago was that? If we believe that the date is exactly 3100 BCE, and you should know that it's a rough date. Right. If we say that it's exactly 3100 BCE, then when, how long ago was that? How would we figure out how long ago was that? Who can give us an understanding of that time frame? I wonder if you know. Are you ready? For the class, I believe you are. Someone's going to answer it. Essentially what we do, essentially what we do is we take 3,100 and add it to the present year. So we are currently in 2022, which means that this occurred 5,122 years ago. 5,100 and 22 years ago. I hope you understand that's a long, long time. What else of importance can you attest occurred at that time? It's a long time. 
It's a really long time. And so I want you to get a sense of what period we're talking about based on this distinct ancient period. So Jabari, sometimes, yes. and and this is a little off topic, a teeny bit, but it circles back to the first thing that I said when I jumped back on again. If the earth is supposed to only be 4,004 years old, then how are we having this wiggle room of a thousand plus years before the creation of the earth, which is something that people who believe the Bible literally uh, believe. So sometimes, not all the time, sometimes when I'm looking at dates, I might overlay other people's interpretation of spirituality and religion. And, and to me, that's just, you know, more proof, like physical, tangible proof of where these stories come from. So just kind of a little bit of a sidebar, but generally relevant, not specifically though. Yeah. I, I, I want you to understand that um, some of those dates that are really bizarre, right? Mm -hmm. uh, they they do come forward in, in Christianity. And you, you should know that um, one of the archbishops um, of, of the Roman Catholic Church actually devised that period. What did he do? He actually looked at um, the time frame of the, the lineage that is listed in the Bible and tried to give um, a, a date. He actually said, by the way, this person was the Archbishop of Armagh, um, James Usher, and I, I, he actually says that the word be, the world began on four um, at uh, four thousand four right. BCE on October twenty third. Yep. <laughs> now I want you to know. Now he's doing this in the sixteen hundreds, right? So I don't want to beat up on him too much. I say that before I'm about to beat up on it, right? So, <laughs> so right. I, I, I mean. You know, the, the reality is so many other people believe that um, this period is um, is designated. The world is designated by um, the Bible. You know, there are Christians that think that the Bible is kind of the map or the blueprint of all of creation of all of the earth. And that, I think, um, should be considered in many ways offensive. Right. There were people that were doing important things long before that book was put together, those books were put together. Um, and there were certainly people who were doing important things and had their own spiritual text. That's right. That that time came together. So it's, it's almost laughable that um, an archbishop in the Christian tradition would think that he could tell us how long um, the earth had existed. It's, a, it's an absolutely ridiculous um, period. Um, but I but I want you to know that's where it comes from. So in some ways, he would have said that the world was a, a, over five thousand years old. That's it. That's what he would have said. Um, and so that 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 is crazy. Um, I also see someone in the um, in the chat that said that um, I think this is Tone Johnson that says BCE means before Christ existed. Um, and um, okay. Sid Sean for Black Excellence TV um, gives us the actual correct. Um, uh, uh, abbreviation, which is before the common era. Now, how did we get that? There was a point where we used to actually, historians used to actually say that um, they were telling time based on before Christ. And then they said Christ was born in the year zero. And then they would say that after that period where they started counting dates slightly differently down from zero, they said that that was then um, uh, uh, A.D. or Anno Domini, like in the year of our Lord. Historians didn't change the numbers any. It would have been difficult to say, well, guess what? You're not in the year 1983. You're actually in this other year. That would have been challenging. But what they did say is, why should we measure all of time according to the Christian tradition? So what right. they ended up saying is, that the, instead of using BC, they would use BCE before the common era. And then they would, instead of using AD Anno Domini, now the nomenclature that is used is CE, which is the common era. And so that is what you'll see. 
that is what we'll see. I do want to say to Tone that Before Christ Existed is a general um, explanation for it because that's that's pretty much how it's used if existed means born. So the idea, the general idea and usage was correct, but Sean is correct when he said before before right. the common era. Right. Now I, right. I don't I'm not saying that I mean Tone's understanding is correct. I mean That's DC right. really yeah. is it's the same thing as BC, which was before Christ, right? Before Christ, right. So he's not what he said is not ridiculous at all. I mean that that's that's really what they they were doing, but they've tried to change the term a little bit. A little so bit, right. a little bit more generic for all the people in the darn world, right? right, right. So that's 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 really what they were trying to do, right? Um, right. But but Sen Sean is correct about the actual abbreviation um, in BCE. I know I see a bunch of shrine members. I'm gonna just say Ankh and Maat to you, everyone from um, Sen William, the Jati of Phoenix. I had a great time in Phoenix this weekend. More on that later. I see Sen Garrick who was there. Um, um, Ankh and Maat to you. I mentioned Sen Sean who was part of the is not only a, fu a, a fully initiated member of the shrine, but also one of the folks that helps Tuesday talk um, keep running. So Ankan Ma'at to you. Ankan Ma'at to you all. I'm sure I've left a bunch of you out. Ankan Ma'at, Ankan Ma'at. And peace to all of you and Ankan Ma'at to the rest of you too. I even see Sen Gaston Bryant, who was I was also with in, in Phoenix. Um, a, a really good brother who does great things there. Ankan Ma'at to you all. I see Sen Corey is on here. I see, listen, this is the family. You hear me? <laughs> this is the family. And so I'm always pleased when I get a chance to talk to the family. So we talked about this period where Namar was, um, when Namar came on the scene, right? We're going to jump to another period. And it's Annette Fifi, right? Another full member. It says Fifia. I'm I'm not, I'm Fifi. Am I messing up your name? I think I used to call you some anyway. Another <laughs> full member of the shrine. I'm right. gonna, I'm gonna, uh, um, when you look here, you actually can see that we're going to jump to another period, right? A period that is literally over a thousand years later. Over a thousand years later. That second period occurs under King Mentuhotep. Sometimes he's called Mentuhotep the first. Sometimes he's called Mentuhotep the second. Okay? We're going to just say the first in this instance. Mentuhotep the first. Then we go to another period, which is uh, nearly 500 years later, under King Amos. King Amos, we'll talk about him next time. And then we go to the next critical era, which is under King Shabaka. And clearly, this is um, the 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 last period that we'll discuss today. We'll talk about the period under Mentuhotep, King Mentuhotep, King Mentuhotep. This is a very important ruler. Um, I have to say that he does very important things. He is part of um, after his period. In many ways, he is considered. He is considered a new founding father of Kemet. That's how important he is. That's how important he is. Um, and I want us to recognize that as you are looking at him, you can recognize that Kemet clearly, once again, is 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 really um, a place that we could should consider an African and African land. So, what was happening that made this period so important? What was, why, why are we mentioning Mentuhotep? Why does his period become one of the critical errors? Is it just because he's black as the midnight sky? No, that's not really why we're, we've, we've focused on him. It's because he does something of critical importance. You should know that we, we talked about dynasties earlier, right? We talked about dynasties earlier. I want you to recognize that essentially what has happened that, that is so interesting is when we got to um, uh, uh, ancient Kemet and we actually see that uh, these dynasties are occurring, there's a period in these dynasties um, in the old kingdom that things become challenging. In fact, 
This is usually considered sort of the end of the Old Kingdom under primarily a ruler um, known as Pepe II. Pepe II. And I'm going to say to you, Pepe is an important ruler. And in addition to that, Pepe is one of those rulers that um, is really um, uh, someone that becomes, I would even say, um, of critical importance in, in comedic history. And he rules for over 90 years, 90 years. Did you hear that? That's a really long period of time. Um, and so I would say to you that he is one of the most important rulers ever to, um, ever to sit on the throne of Kemet. But because he rules for such a long period, what happens? There are some rulers that there are some historians that argue that during this time, um, Kemet begins to struggle because um, Pepe is so old. What might actually happen is that um, uh, he is sort of, um, how do I describe this? He is designating a lot of power to the, um, to the rest of uh, his, his, um, his nobles. And so when he finally comes to his end, what seems to happen is he might have actually left some confusion around what should happen in Kemet. And so there are many that say that this period might have actually led to a period of turmoil in Kemet. So we see that, that, um, that, uh, uh, um, we see that essentially what's happening, I keep reading the chat. I'm going to stop reading the chat now because it's distracting me. But um, at, we actually end up seeing that what uh, happens is Kemet kind of falls apart. It has this major fall, a major fall. I'm going to tell you right off the bat that no other nation has two major falls and finds a way to pick his back, itself back up and continue to be even more powerful than it was before the fall. No other nation is that resilient. And I want us to recognize that one of the things that I would think really categorizes, really um, is a, 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 a trait of Africans that we see throughout African history is that we see African people are resilient. And for those of you who have never thought of it that way before, just imagine that we're sitting here speaking to each other on YouTube. And I would assume that most of the people who are um, listening to this are people of African descent, if not all. <laughs> and as you're looking at it, just think about the things that have happened to us. Think about the, the challenges we've had and think about the fact that we are sitting here once again, poised to ascend. African people are resilient. So we see that this challenging period seems to begin under Pepe, after Pepe II um, has his end. And during this period, things are really, really difficult. This, is, this period is generally called the first intermediate period. The first intermediate period. In ancient comedic history, we tend to, historians tend to parse up this 3,000 years into these large, large chunks because how do you talk about 3000 years right so they they take the dynasties and then they make these things called kingdoms there's the old kingdom that's kind of at the beginning at least the beginning of the dynastic era then there's this great fall called the first intermediate period then there is the middle kingdom that's what we're going to talk tonight there's another fall that leads to the second intermediate period. And that's when we have foreign people on the throne in control of Kemet. By the way, when we get to that one, Abu Sashat, it's going to be a controversial night. Because there are a lot of discussions, depictions of who those foreign people must be, right? Spoiler alert, there are many that argue that those foreign people are the proto-Hebrews, that they're the people that will go on to become the Hebrews. So we're going to talk about that next time. And then Kemet has another fall, and then it's put back together 
by, um, this is the third intermediate period, it's put back together really by the, the Kushites that come from the South to put Kemet back together. So we're gonna talk tonight about what happens in the first intermediate period. What happens in the first intermediate period? After um, Pepe II and there's this turmoil and there are all sorts of people that um, are claiming to be king, all sorts of people that really just have control of small areas, things fracture. It fractures so much that even foreign people are able to just come into Kemen and do whatever they want. Right. It's fractured it is. There is during this period something else that happens that's interesting. We see comedic literature really begin to take off. This is when we begin to see people writing and, and there's a lot, there are different genres and um, all of this actually starts in the old kingdom, but really takes off in the first intermediate period into the middle kingdom. You should just recognize that as we talk about these genres of literature, these are genres before anyone else, most people even have literature at all. Very, very, very interesting. Okay, let's continue. So we're looking at Mentuhotep. But before we even talk about Mentuhotep, we gotta talk about his parents. So whenever Kemet is struggling, this is something you should know, Whenever Kemet is struggling, or even whenever it gets started, it is always put back into divine order, brought back into Ma'at by folks that are in the interior of Africa. Mm. So we see Namr come forward from further in the interior to conquer the people in the north to create Kemet. And then we will see that Mentuhotep does something a little similar. With all of the turmoil that existed in ancient Kemet at this time, there's one sacred city that is still intact. And this city is generally the city that we, the Kemetic people, called Waset. Waset. Waset means something like the seat of power, the seat of dominion. So you should know that all throughout the 3,000 years of Kemetic history, you will always see powerful things happening in Waset. Now, some of you are thinking, I ain't never heard of no Waset. You probably heard it under different names. Because remember, those foreign people come in and they start changing all of these names, right? So we go from Waset. When the Greeks come in, they start calling that city Thebes. Thebes. You might have heard of Thebes. In fact, sometimes Mentuhotep is called a Theban ruler. They're using the Greek name. And then when the Arabs actually come in after the Arab invasion of Egypt, they're using the word Egypt now because after the Greek period, they actually look at this great city and they see the ruins of these magnificent, magnificent um, grounds of these structures, right? They think that those grounds are, um, are palaces. And the word for palace in the Arabic language is something like Uqsur. So they started calling this the city of the palaces, al Uqsur. And from there, the word Luxor comes about. Mm -hmm. And so today that city is now known as Luxor. It's known as Luxor. And, um, oh, look at Clifton adding some information. Wonderful, wonderful. One of the full members of the shrine. Good, good job. Um, and so as you see this, recognize that when we look at Luxor, Luxor, later, that city is so beautiful. It's still beautiful today, by the way. It's just beautiful. It's just beautiful. When you are, when I'm at the hotel, which overlooks the Hopi, and you also see the mountains, and you see the sun come up over the mountains, you just, I mean, it is impossible for you not to feel at peace. It is That's a so beautiful, beautiful city. You've experienced that. Sometimes. I have. The, the heat from the sun, the directness of the sun, the warmth of it, you submit to it in a very natural way, not in a like dogmatic kind of a way. Mm -hmm. And just the, the, the divine is so present there. Yeah. It is, it is over, not overwhelming in a bad, it's all encompassing. That's the word I use. It's all encompassing. And when you learn different, 
names for different aspects like Shu and Tefnut and Ra and Geb and Newt. And then you go to Kemet, you know why our ancestors had to recognize these different discrete, ele discrete elements of the divine because it's so ever present and powerful and peaceful. If you haven't gone, you got to go. I have yeah, to go back. You really do have to go. I mean, because it really is just one of those things that, um, I mean, when you go, it is just so magnificent and so um, edifying to actually take the trip that it's one of those things that I think that everyone, particularly every African, should do. I think that we should all decide that we're going to experience this wonderful um, place. And, and uh, it is just, it's just amazing. So this is the city that, um, that uh, Mentuhotep and his four parents live in. By the way, I, I was going to show you something really quickly. Maybe I will. I think I will show it to you. Um, I, we were talking about how it feels to be in that um, in that city. Just when you at the at the um, at the hotel, take a look at this picture for a sec. Got to see it. Oh, what happened? There we go. This is my mother standing in that wonderful city. She was like, oh my goodness, I want to eat. Why are you taking a picture? But she, I, we had to just look at the That's sun. So beautiful. On the hop. This is the balcony from our hotel room. Can you show just the picture, Sean, just the picture so we can get the full effect. Look at, look at Ross sitting right there. Look, look I mean, at the mountains. How it really you... is. It, it's a it's a really powerful place, and um, so we ended up before running to get food. We ended up <laughs> here goes Anika and my mom there. Um, just, just magnificent, and then the three of us. Oh, that's so all sweet. trying to figure out where to look. Right, they're like, where do we look? <laughs> but it's just it's just a. Um, an amazing experience. And so this city is beautiful. Um, and I'm not surprised that the Arabs, who didn't know the language, tried to give it a majestic name, right? Um, and But so it is just one of those places that you gotta see for yourself. You just have to see it for yourself. So what happens in this time? It seems that during this period, we begin to see jockeying for um, the reunification of Kemet. Because as I've said to you, there is um, lots of um, uh, uh, discord around um, who is in control of Kemet. There are tons of people who are trying their best to say that they are king, but they ain't. They just ain't. <laughs> right? they, got, they got this little tiny fiefdom and it's like, why are you faking the funk now? You know very well you are not the king, right? One of those people who was powerful in this sacred city of Waset actually speaks something that must have sounded insane. It must have absolutely seen, seemed like something that was, he was just, um, I don't know, it was a flight of fancy. What does he say? He actually says that his name is going to be Intef Sertawi. Intef Sertawi. And he also decides that he is going to depict himself in what is known as his name in what is known as a Sarek. What is he saying? He's saying, guess what? I am going to unify Kemet. Kemet is coming back. And it's been a long period of time, so this is a tall order. There's his name in the Sarek. The Sarek is an early version of what used to be called, um, what sometimes is called um, uh, a cartouche, which we know is called the Shen. There's so much to teach. I have to try to not teach um, an entire course in just a little bit of time. But know that this is the first king, Intef Siratawi. Um, this is so, so powerful, family, that someone would actually decide that he's going to say, I'm going to put this place back together. I mean, it really is just a, um, 
a, an amazing, amazing thing that he would think that he could do that. And so he begins. He begins. He is the one that's going to cause the two lands to be put back together. He starts um, uh, really in sort of disagreement with um, a, a, a set of rulers known as the, um, they're, they're rulers from a city that's not that far away, but it's generally a city known that you can consider to be known as um, Het Nesut. Het Nesut. Um, the Greeks came and they said that city should be known as um, Heracleopolis. Heracleopolis, right? Um, and so as they begin to fight, they are now saying, you know what? We're going to take control of all of Kemet. And they slowly begin, they slowly begin to contest with them and to take control. And so that is what happens. We begin to see a battle. By the way, you know the city, the Greeks call this city Heracleopolis, right? Right? They call it Heracleopolis. Well, if they call it Heracleopolis, that means the Greeks were connecting this city with Hercules, right? Right. I just want you to recognize that if you listen to the Greeks long enough, they will tell you that their tradition is a version of the Kemetic tradition. I don't even have time to go into that. But you just got to understand that if you listen to what they say, they are saying they're getting their tradition from ancient Kemet. It's their version of it. And virtually everyone else in the Mediterranean region does that as well. So we start with um, Intef Sertawi. He takes a little bit of land. Then we see his son. His name is called Intef um, uh, Wa'ank. Intef Wa'ank. Um, and Intef Wa'ank, who is usually just known as Intef II, um, is a really important ruler um, because he continues what his father is doing. Here's an image of Intef, uh, Intef II or Intef Wa'ank from the Metropolitan Museum. Take a look at that. Here he is. Here's an image of Intef Wa'ank here. And you can see him here. I'd say he's preparing to do important things. That's just the way that you should look at it. He is preparing to do important things. Um, and uh, as he's doing this, just recognize that this is um, something that we're seeing that is going to lead to the, the, um, the, the resurrection of the Kemetic people. Uh, the Kemetic people are coming um, into their power once more. So we see Intef Wa'ank. And then he takes a little bit more um, uh, 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 space. He's trying to actually reunify Kemet. The idea of his father, he does not complete it. He does not complete it. Um, and so what ends up happening is we then end up seeing um, that his son continues this. His son continues the drive, continues the drive to take control of Kemet. His tongue, his son is known as um, um, Intef Noctep Nef Nefer. Noctep Nefer. Intef Noctep Nefer. So now we're seeing that this plan to make Kemet powerful again, this plan to allow Kemet to be the nation that it should be, actually is one that spans not just one person, but not, and not just two people, not just three people, but in fact, we see that its plan occurs, that this plan occurs over the course of four different rulers. This is amazing to me. This is amazing to me. And so we see this next ruler continue the work of his father and his father's father. 
Um, I just have to say that when we think about um, uh, uh, what happens during this period, I, I mentioned to you that if we were going to talk about Africans, we should actually recognize that in some ways, Africans are marked by their resilience, right? You heard me say that. Right. That they are marked by their resilience. But in, in many ways, they're marked by something else as well. Mm -hmm. They're also marked by their commitment to putting together and seeing come into existence long range plans. This is something else we see occur in Kemet. Jabari, yes. uh, to, to your point, um, Atena Munra said, it's interesting how the planning always starts with the elders and the victory not accomplished until they are ancestors. The Entef rulers seem to have a long-term plan. Yeah. And Sinet Portia wants to know what Entef means. I'm not sure if you define that, but can you mm -hmm. comment? You know I'm glad I'm glad you asked that because I meant to say it earlier and I'm obviously I didn't. Um yeah and and it's so interesting that you've asked that question at the very time that um uh, uh after you talk about what they did. Guess what intef means? Intef means it was given to me by my father. That's what intef means. So clearly they have a plan and that they are working that plan based on their um, their vision of what to do based on what the elder and then the ancestor tells them to do. That's right. That's what we see. We see that the African excels at long-term planning. When I'm talking about long-term planning, I'm talking about planning that takes literally in this instance, several generations. Slowly, you build. Slowly, you strategize. Slowly, you work the plan. And in order to do that, you must be able to see that um, you're going to have setbacks, but that you have to celebrate your victories and continue to work your plan. Sometimes people get disappointed Sometimes people say, well, I thought I was going to be able to do something and I wasn't. So I guess I'm going to just live a mediocre life. But I want to say to you, that is not what our ancestors did. Our ancestors said, work, plan your work and work the plan. And clearly, we have seen people of African descent really deal with some of the most difficult periods that any human being could imagine, right? That's right. That's, That's what right. we see. We see African people um, be the people that were abused, that were taken from their home, that their, their homelands are under the control of foreign people. We see so much that African people have continued to struggle. But I want you to recognize it is your ancestors that say, plan and work, plan and work. You will have setbacks. This should be expected that you'll have setbacks. Don't become so focused on your setbacks. Don't become set astray by your setbacks. Don't get to the point where you think that the setback is the plan. Don't get to the point where you think that falling down is who you are. Don't get so um, disgruntled that you think, why should I ever have made a plan? I should have known that no plan was going to work. Who am I to plan lofty aim? Who am I to think that I can control the universe? Your ancestors worked their plans. And sometimes those plans actually exceeded the life of one powerful individual, two power individuals, three powerful individuals, and um, the plan isn't actually um, brought into its final fruition until much later. But oh, what beauty comes when that aim is completed. So we then see that Intef, um, uh, uh, Nakhneb Tef Nefer comes onto the scene and he continues 
to um to uh move forward he continues to um take some land it does not happen under his reign he is not able to complete the story he's not able to do all that he would have liked to do this is interesting this is interesting he just simply says you know what why should i say that there's a failure when there is when there is um a group of people who are coming behind me that will see my vision in fact really the best thing that anyone can ever do is celebrate the victories of our ancestors while also completing their un in incomplete work, their incomplete work. We have to look at the ancestors and say, what are we doing to make sure that their plans, that their ideas come into fruition? That's and right. that is what we, we see happen. So INTEF 3 isn't successful. He doesn't complete it. Who actually completes this? Well, you know that we're talking about um, this particular powerful man of the evening, right? We're talking about Mentu Hotep, sometimes called the first, sometimes called the second. We're going to call him the first right now, okay? Mentu Hotep the first. And we actually see that he has to continue to fight, by the way. Why do we believe he has to continue to fight? Because his name is Mentu Hotep. Who was Mentu? sometimes called Montu. Why does that name particularly important? I'd love for someone to tell me what Montu is, who Montu is, and then by extension, what does Montu mean? What does Montu mean? Why is it that we're talking about Montu today? Um, and, and I'm going to tell you that if you understand who Montu is in the, the narrative of, of ancient Kemet, you'll begin to understand what Mentu Hotep really had to do. Because I'm telling you, the name itself, his name itself, tells us exactly what is necessary. Exactly what is necessary. So, um, do we have answers, by the way? We do. Can you hear me, Jabari? Yes, I can. Okay, so I have Tahuti Hekak, uh, Keparasan warrior. Uh, Dr. LaRoche said um, a, a war netter. So did Atana Munra. Mantu is a netter of war. Mm. And um, Daniel LaRoche said the same thing. Heru in the oh and Atan Amunra said Heru in the form of a bull. By the way, you should know that pretty much everyone that answered the question, those are all ringers, right? I mean, they, 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 the people who have been studying. Who are people? No, I'm kidding. Some of them are study have studied with me, and I'm honored to be able to to assist them in uh, in that study. But you should know that they these are folks that have been studying for a while, and because of that, we should expect that um, they have really good answers for this question. Um, Sen, um, Sean, obviously, is an initiate of the shrine. Um, you know that he's done great study. Um, Dr. LaRoche, our dear brother, Sen Daniel, actually traveled with us to Kemet. He is doing study. He's constantly um, uh, 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 studying and trying to make application of the Kemetic tradition. Um, to, to Hudi Heka Kepara, I would love to know. I'm not sure if I know who that person is. Y'all, you need to hit me up and let me know who you are, okay? Because answering the question puts you in um, a, a, a very small group of people. And of course, Senaton has been studying in a, for a really long time and, and is also in the, in the history class as well. So you know that they're going to give you very strong answers. Um, Montu is usually depicted this way. Let's see if I can show you an image of Montu. He's usually depicted this way.
He's, uh, I, in some ways, I usually say that Montu is a form of Heru, mm -hmm. right? You see him with the falcon. Many deities in ancient Kemet were depicted by the falcon. Ra was also a falcon. But one of the ways that you're able to um, tell them apart is by, usually by the headdress. Without reading, you'll be able to see um, the headdress, right? Mm -hmm. Can you see that you're seeing the falcon, beautiful, rend beautifully rendered falcon face, by the way, with the sun, with the plumes, with feather plumes behind it? By the way, sometimes people say to me, Jabari, um, you keep saying that these comedic deities were symbols. And I, I give them answers and they just ignore my answers. It, it really is frustrating sometimes. But I mean, can you imagine you're seeing a, a deity with a falcon head, an image of the sun, and the sun has um, a, 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 a serpent coming from the sun and then feather plumes behind the sun. How could this be anything other than symbolism? Right. I just you have to ignore that. <laughs> I don't even know how to to answer those questions. Sometimes I mean, which questions are they trying to look at it literally? Yeah, yeah. They These the it. people thought they were literal. Really? They just you don't you ignore them because they are playing. Yeah, it, it is. It is. It is frustrating. Um, yeah. In to that, you should know that Montu is sometimes also depicted as a bull. And that's what um, Senaton was mentioning, right? right. Sometimes that. he's also depicted as a bull. And so in that instance, you right. would have to read. You'd have to read the glyphs. Um, usually the name is written with the, the men board. Then you see the wave. You see the tether rope, which is really a chew. So it really could be, um, uh, it's either thu or chew. I think most people would either say it's Menchu or Menthu is how they would depict it. And then you see the um the the chick, which is the ooh sound, right? So that's how you'd actually see the name Montu. You would that's how you would actually see it. Um and and that's really one of the ways that we should actually come into understanding of what this great deity did, right? That's how we come into understanding of what this great deity did. This is how we should understand that these great deities, um, these great rulers were um, doing important things. I just wanna show really quickly, this is from the Ptolemaic era, but you'll see part of the name here, right? Can you zoom in? Yeah. I'm a zoom, can, yeah. You can, can you make that a single screen, just the picture itself? I'll do that. There we go. Okay, great. Good to have people backing you up. Uh -huh. Can you see the men board? This looks like a playing board. This is the men sound. And then you come here and you actually, let me see if I can get it a little closer. Then you actually see the wave of energy, right? That's the end sound. And then you see the tether rope. This is a rope with two loops on the, uh, on the end, right? Now, what you don't see is the chick here. The chick is probably, it might, the chick might be here. Maybe it's been lost. But this is the neb sound. This is the, the name for Lord there. And then the 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 T um, for the the um the feminine sound. So I want you to recognize you're seeing part of the name rendered right here in the glyphs where you see. Um, in the image where you see Montu as well. Okay? All right, let's continue. So we have to know that um, Mentu Hotep is a war deity because he got the name, is is a war, is a had to do battle, let me say. Let me say it differently. We have to know that Mentu Hotep had to do battle because his name depicts the fact that he had to fight. His very name depicts the fact that he had to fight. Mm -hmm. That is really important to me. Really important. So let's talk a little bit more about um, Mentu Hotep himself. Because <clears throat> we we spent quite a bit of time leading up to what this great ruler does. 
So Jabari, I also want yes. to acknowledge, you know, Hotep means peace yes. or, or yes. offering yes. juxtaposed yes. to, uh, a, you know, someone where the name is someone ready to battle and for war, I, war I, nectar and peace. Usually historians render Hotep or Hetep in that instant as pleased. So it's almost like in my coming, the war deity is pleased. Right? Mm -hmm. Obviously, it means that you are doing the work of that deity if you can say that they are pleased in your name. And so that's usually the way that it is it is rendered. Um, let me show you a quick slide. This is from my class on comedic history. I'm only showing you a few of the slides. The class is a full 14, um, for 15 week um, class, college level class, so that you understand um, the, the history of ancient Kemet. And you can see a better image of this wonderful statue that represents Mentuhotep. This statue is in the Cairo Museum, the, the what is usually called the Egyptian Museum in Cairo. And it's, it's one of those things, it's so clearly African that when people pass it, they often are confused. They're <laughs> often confused. They're like, wait a minute, I didn't know they were black. And you actually see- That's um, the, the, the tour guides leading them start scratching and stuttering. They're like, Ugh. That's denial. Ain't nobody confused. They have a lot man. of challenges. They have tons of challenges with that. Um, and so this is a very, very funny thing. By the way, um, I see Sinek Cortia asked if this was his birth name. I believe that it was his birth name because then he takes his, his, re, his reign name is Neb Hetep, Ned Hepet Ray, Neb Hepet Ray, had Neb Hepet Ray, which means something like um, Ra is the rudder, the rudder, Hetep, Hepet, Hepet is rudder. What's a rudder? A rudder is the thing that steers the ship. So he's he also is saying that the deity Ra sets his course. And that's another powerful, powerful name. Another powerful name. Um, by the way, uh, Sen Tehuti Hekahet um, uh, Kepara, I see that you've asked for my email. Um, I'm going to just put my email for the shrine in the chat. So that you can have access to it. You have access to me. I see that you're a student and you're doing some work. That's wonderful. Reach out to me. Let me know what's going on so we can connect. Okay. And and also, you can also DM, send a direct message to the Shrine of Ma'at. Jabari will get it, or I will get it, mm -hmm. or Nika will get it, and just make it clear who you want, who you're actually talking to, and we'll get it. Yeah, that's, tell that's easier, actually. Because Jabari sometimes has tons and tons and tons of email. It's helpful right. sometimes for folks to bring things to my attention uh, because it's it does. Yeah. You should just DM us, mm -hmm. it'll be easier. Yeah, but you have my email, which comes directly to me as well. Right. Okay, so take a look. So Mentu Hotep is the one that finally completes the reunification of Kemet. He takes three Heru names. This is one of the reasons why I say that sometimes he's called um, Mentu Hotep the first and Mentu Hotep the second. When you got this many names, <laughs> historians get confused. Which Mentu Hotep is this? I'm so confused. That happens sometimes. So some books will depict him as Mentu Hotep the first. Some books will depict him as Mentu Hotep the second. Don't get confused by it. Just understand that. Really, the ancient people would not have been confused because every king has many, at least five names. That's right. So they would have been able to say, well, which Mentu Hotep? And they would have had um, another one of his names to make it clear for them, okay? His, names, and his name is also he who gives his heart to the two lands, Lord of the White Crown, and the Uniter of the two lands. You should know that while he had to fight, he reigns particularly most of his 50 year reign. Can you imagine being on the, on the, um, on the uh, throne for 50 years? 50 years, uh, most of his reign is very peaceful, right? He does have some um, skirmishes with the folks that are in um, uh, Canaan, what we call Canaan today, right? They would have probably used the name, um, uh, 
oh goodness, I'm having a, a senior moment. What's the thing? Uh, they probably would have mentioned uh, Sharuhan. Sharuhan is probably what they would have mentioned. Um, and then you also see that he they he also has a military action against the Nubians. Of course, they would not have said Nubians. They probably would have talked about the particular group that was to the south, but they might have used the word Kush as well. Okay. Um, there are other words for those people that live at the South, right? Because for most of Kemetic history, they weren't one unified nation. More on that when we talk about the Nubians, and we should at some point. Um, he, he actually has 60 bodies of soldiers that fought with him at his temple that is in a place that is today called Deir el Bakri. We'll talk more about that. There's 60 soldiers that are buried with him. Right? Um, he's considered a major ruler by all of the um, further um, Kemetic rulers all throughout the rest of Kemetic time. They're all, they're all looking at Namur and they're all looking at Mentuhotep because of how important what he did was. And he also has several wives, um, uh, several of them. One of them is known as Tem. And the other one is Neferu. Those are some of the, the chief wives that he had, Nam, um, Tem and Neferu. And I'm going to say to you that um, uh, folks often misrepresent them because they are dark-skinned women. They're always depicted as dark-skinned women. Um, and when you go to the Metropolitan Museum, the description of them as dark-skinned mm -hmm. women is behind a staircase from the major exhibit. Ain't nobody read that except me. That's how it is. Here's an image of one of his queens. By the way, you would have to know that these are black ladies because um, they get their hair did. And by the way, <laughs> in addition to that, I think this is pretty funny as well. Um, in addition to that, um, these ladies, uh, the, the hairdressers were so important to them that in their tombs, they talk about those ladies that did their hair. That's right. Very important to them. Um, and so uh, this is a really important distinction. We need to recognize that um, as we look at these ladies, we are seeing these these deeply melanated sisters That's who, right. um, uh, who are powerful and are the ladies that assist in the um, in the uh, uh, the the regeneration of Kemet. Let's call it that. The regeneration of Kemet. Um, this is one of the, oh, this is another one of the ladies. This one is Kemsit. Look at Kemsit. Let me see. Kemsit is from, this image is in the British Museum. Here's Kemsit. Who are we talking about? Who are we talking about? You see her features? Look at how she's being depicted. Who are we talking about? And you'll also see this image. This one's in the Metropolitan Museum. This is of Neferu. This is the queen, one of the, the great queens of Mentuhotep. Here's Neferu. one of the great queens of Mentu Old Town. I got to say something about this. Please we, do. We went on this tour. It was the priests. It was the nine of us. Mm -hmm. Wasn't everybody present? Was everybody present? Uh, pro probably. Yeah. And it was so much fun. And we got to this place. And you could just see she is getting her hair did. Yes, and, she is. It, and it looks like there might even be a weave uh, going on because there's a tool that you see, and there are there are times when I have explained the ancestral sisterhood that is a part of getting your hair done when you are a black woman, mm -hmm. and you have another black woman doing your hair. And let me just say African, so that I include all Pan Africans, so there's no confusion about who I'm talking about. And, and this, and I have been uh, in Instagram th threads, you would have thought I was Jabari Osaze because I was uh -huh. schooling them, letting them know. And then a couple of them DM'd me 
and I showed them my video of this so they would know when you let other people put their hands in your hair, you are, you are not in the tradition of how we get our hair done as black women. Look at her face. You know, she was like, girl, look at her lips. Look. By, by the way, you mentioned that she was probably getting um, things attached to her hair. Can you see? This is also from the, the reign of Mentehotep from okay. one of the queens. Do you notice that the hair that she's tending is not attached to the head? Now, I know this is fragmentary, but you can see that this hair is not touching someone's head. So, right. yes, they were talking about adding hair to this woman's head. Um, and so, so many of these things that we see um, are, are, are many ways familiar to us. That's right. That's absolutely right. Familiar to us. They, they're actually, they should, we should recognize that while these folks lived in a, a quite a distant time, some of the things that they did are things that we do. That we still do today. Because I'm going to do they, on Friday. Because they are part of African culture. That's right. And so that is why we should recognize these important um, uh, behaviors of great Africans. Okay. Jabari, before we move on, I want yeah. to, this is kind of a tangent question, but it's an important one. Yes. Um, Stephanie Lewis asked, may, may we one day do a study of Akhenaten and his unfortunate choice to lead the ancient Kemetic Africans away from their spiritual system to a monotheistic religion. Can you add some clarity to that, Jabari? Uh, yeah, I think that uh, there's a lot that has been done on Akhenaten, right? Um, I talk about Akhenaten in my class as well. So there's, we talk, you should know that this is not just Tuesday. We don't just do it on Tuesday talk, right? Jabari teaches a 15 week course that is a college level course on comedic history. It's similar to some of the work that I did at Cornell. Mm -hmm. um, fortunately, the course that I learned when I learned it at Cornell, it wasn't taught from an African perspective. Um, but um, I, because it was in the department, it was the Department of Near Eastern Studies, by the way. I don't think I've ever said why it wasn't taught in African. Um, that particular class was not in Africana Studies where I was a student. Wow, I did not know that. It was taught in the Department of Near Eastern Studies. I'm sure that when Anika had, when Anika learned the uh, Menu Netter, she had to go to the Department of Near Eastern Studies as well. Um, and so, you know, that was that was part of the challenge. So I've been teaching this class for many years now, um, and it is one of the times that you get to think more about Akhenaten. Um, and it, so it's very interesting. I also see a question from, um, from uh, Sen M, Michael Herbert, um, one of the full members of the shrine. Um, do I, do I, do I. By the way, I never, I never mention this because I always mention it after I'm off the live. Michael Herbert, whenever I'm on, on Netter or anywhere, he usually sends something to Cash App. I just want to say Dwa to you um, uh, because he recognizes that it takes, it's, it's, it ain't easy to do this, right? Um, and it's certainly doing this is not how I pay my bills, <laughs> unfortunately. It's, I'm, I do it because it's something I'm passionate about. And he was mentioning that it are they both ladies? If you can put, let's see if I can put this back on the screen. Um, it's there, right? Yeah, of course. There it is. Everyone's a lady. No, this person here is likely. I believe this is a man. These two on the, uh, the these two are ladies. This right. is the queen. This is her hairdresser, and right. this I believe is a man who was a servant who was pouring her something to drink. That yeah, that looks like a, that's how I like it to be done. Yeah, he's he right. Right. <laughs> so that's that's what we're seeing here. We're seeing um, that they're actually getting that he's being she's being given a drink. Okay. Um, no, I don't have enough time to read the glyphs here. I see like Sir Sirah. I'd have can to. You, I'd have to do can some you zoom in? Can you zoom in? Sure. You talking about to the face, to the guy? To the this glyphs guy. that you were reading. Yeah, this is the guy. I was trying to read this. You can see this is like one of the S sounds. This is the another one of the O sounds. I mean, Ooh. so it's kind of um, uh, uh, um, I don't know the word because you know when you're so reading the language, not only do you have to look for the um the sound, you have to also know the word. It's a lot more complicated. Than it might actually seem. 
So some of what I'm reading, I'm able to read. I wasn't able to read that. Um, I'd have to do some more work and take a little time to figure out what's being said there. But um, by the way, you know, sometimes when I'm on Sonnetter and other times people say, you know, uh, uh, you know, this is one of those times that, um, you know, uh, uh, Jabari never reads the language. And if they just would watch me long enough, they would see that I'm constantly reading. Anyway, um, it's one of the ways that folks try to attack uh, me. And so it, it can be a little tedious. Anyway, take a look. So here is, so that image was Mentu Hotep from the Cairo Museum. This is the image of Mentu Hotep in the Metropolitan Museum. And you can see by the features that we are depicting, we are depicting a person of African descent. Look at the nose, look at the lips. We know who we're talking about. Can you zoom in on the face? I'm gonna actually, um, let me look for the image. Okay. Show it to you. And um, Dua means thank you. And so Dua U means many thanks. Right. Right. So this is the image of Mentehotep in the in the um in in the Metropolitan Museum. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, very important um image. Uh, and. If you look closely, the lighting in this room is not that great. It never has been. In the <laughs> but if you look at it very closely, it's clear that it also had lots of black paint on it um, as well. Oh, here's the here's the statue. Now they've taken it away from where it sits in the museum to take a really good picture. And I, you should be clear who we're talking about, right? I mean, those features, I don't know who else they they you could think that they're talking about here. But you notice he has like a slight smile on his face in both of these images. Mm -hmm. Jabari, do you, yes. you know who he looks like right there? Who? Asar Imhotep. A little bit. Eh, I usually say he looked like Yafet Kodo there. Am I, am I dating myself? Who, Jabari? Yeah, see? Yafet Kodo was um, a very powerful uh, and important uh, um, um, actor. Um, let's see if I can show you an image of Yafet Kodo. I'm not saying Asar Imhotep is meant to Hotep. I'm just saying like in the face just a little bit. Yeah, I'm saying that's what he looked like to me. That's Yafet Kodo. Oh, you think he looks like? Yes. When I what look at him, I go, that's Yafet Kodo. <laughs> do you use that voice? You know, yes, I do. Because Yafet Kodo was one of the few actors that was prominent in Hollywood during the 60s, 70s, 80s that was dark skinned and had very um, uh, 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 African features. Mm -hmm. Right? So when I see um, Mentu Hotep, that's who I think of. By the way, I want to say that um, Yafet Kodo was in the movie Alien. Some of you might have seen the original Alien movie. Um, that's, that's, uh, Yafet Kodo. Um, anyway, just so, just so you know, that's, that's always who I compare him to. <laughs> A deep, black, powerful man, um, who was very, very, um, uh, he was very prominent in Hollywood and also very clear about his African self as well. He looks familiar. He does look familiar. Well, if you saw Alien, you know, he was also in that series, um, Homicide, which was very popular. That's what I, that's, that, there it is. Because One I of the first series on American TV, I'll tell you. Uh -huh. He was in that Schwarzenegger movie, um, The Running Man, right? Um, very important, very important. Um, and, and born in New York City, a New York, a New Yorker. He looks like a New Yorker. <laughs> a New Yorker, so, you know, anyway. Let's continue. So take a look at that. Uh, so the question I was asking that I don't think I got an answer for is why do you think, why do you think he's smiling in this image? What's he got to smile about? And why is he smiling in this particular statue? What are your thoughts, family? Do you notice that? I mean, this is a dude that had to fight, right? But he's smiling here. Here he is in the in the Cairo Museum image. You can see that he has a slight smile on his face. 
Why? Well, I'm going to say to you, yeah, see, uh, uh, Sen Rich says, I completed the work. I want you to recognize, oh, and uh, I'm going to go back to that one in a minute. As you notice, when you look at this, he is he has this expression on his face while he's wearing the red crown. The red crown is the one that he was not born with. Mm -hmm. So he is actually saying, I did my father's, my grandfather's, my great grandfather's work. I was successful. I was given this task before I was born. Mm. The very concept of my existence was for me to do the work of my forefathers. And he completes it successfully. So that's why you see him looking like this with the red crown particularly. By the way, the red crown here is depicted much larger than it usually is. <laughs> I can only imagine what that ceremony must have looked like. What it looked like. I mean, he clearly must have been really thinking, man, I did it. I'm going to have them make the largest red crown that anyone has ever seen in, in life. And I think that that's really powerful. It's beautiful. It's powerful. So let's continue. Let's continue. Um, you're seeing images of Mentuhotep. You've seen images of his wives. He is really, as you know, a very influential ruler, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I, I'm going to say this briefly before we we um, sort of come to an end on this. Your this is an image of one of the most magnificent Kemetic temples in existence. It's a temple that was built by a queen who ruled as king. Her name is Hatshepsut. We're not gonna talk about Hatshepsut tonight, but I'm gonna say to you, look at how it's built out of the mountain. <laughs> Beautiful space. By the way, when you get there, it's hot. It's hot. Yes. It is hot. So, um, as you go here, I want you to recognize as important as a space this is, it was built because she was paying homage. Oh, I'm not, I didn't even do it yet. Here it is. She was paying homage to Mentuhotep. Mm. When you're at the top of her temple and you look down, you can see this other space that is completely um, destroyed. This was the temple of Mentuhotep. So she built her temple next to his in homage to him. Mm. That is so powerful. Can you move the cursor over the space that was dedicated to him or like just- This whole uh, thing is his, this is his temple. Okay. The whole thing, the whole thing. This is the, the, the mortuary temple of Mentuhotep. Now I'm gonna say to you, I go obviously every year, sometimes more than once a, uh, uh, in a year. And as you look at it, I'm beginning to see that there's been enough archeological work done that slowly they're trying to put it back together. There may be a time, possibly outside of my life, that they have reconstructed enough of it that they'll uh, people will always will often will also be able to go see this magnificent temple reconstructed. And I want to say to you, as you look at um, at Shetsud's temple, you have to also see this. And I would argue to you that the Lincoln Memorial, there, folks are, Europeans are going to tell you this is based on the Parthenon. But I'm saying that the Parthenon was based on Hatshepsut's temple. And the Lincoln Memorial is based on the Parthenon. So obviously that means that the Lincoln Memorial is connected to the temple of Hatshepsut. So many things in this Western world have been signed with the names of your wonderful mothers and fathers. That's right. But unfortunately, they think that because they stole our names that we will no longer remember theirs either. We have to do work. We have to do work. Take a look at these models. You should also know that um, in that area near where Mentuhotep was, um, was buried was a tomb of his his um, high official, a, a noble that worked 
very closely with Mentehotep. His name was Meket Ray. And these models, that these beautiful models of people with these this rich brown skin actually come from the tomb of Meket Ray. And essentially what you should understand, this is very interesting. Um, the way that this works is um, there was this space up in um, the mountains. Uh, an excavator for the Metropolitan Museum was there. He didn't think that they found anything, but he said, well, we'll clear out this tomb that we already know of. And what we'll do as we clear it out is we'll be able to um, take some precise measurements. And as they did that, something interesting happened. The person clearing out the sand recognized that as much as he swept, sand kept going into a crevice in the floor, which meant because it would never able to be filled, there must have been a room underneath. They opened it up and they saw all of these wonderful models um, coming out of that space. They come from the tomb of Meket Ray. And you should also know that these images of these powerful Nubian soldiers, they also were working with Mentuhotep. This is a model that is, a, is meant to describe these um, these wonderful Nubians that were fighting along with Mentu Hotep. Very important place um, that uh, is meant to describe the reign of a very important ruler. And so we've come to the end of our discussion of Mentu Hotep in the second critical error of ancient Kemet. The second critical error of ancient Kemet. Um, I'm hoping that through our discussion of these periods, you will have a better understanding of how Kemet actually gives civilization to the world. And you'll have to also have a better understanding of the African nature, uh, nature of ancient Kemet and also how Kemet can be described very, very well according to the manner in which its, um, its great civilization was run from according to these four errors. We're talking about 3,000 years of history, right? The best way to understand the 3,000 years of history is for um, you to look at these critical errors. It will help you understand how it works. Okay? So... Jabari, there's is of critical importance. Next time we'll talk about when foreign people take the throne and the the ancient African rebellion of indigenous people that pushes them from the region. That should be great. I look forward to that one. Yes. I have one question. Go ahead. It's a bit off topic. Victor Thomas asked, "Is the tradition seventy days of mourning from Egypt?" Hebraic or both? Um, there are some people that argue that the 70 day ritual comes from Kemet um, and that it is connected to the period of time that one would be prepared to enter a Merkut, uh, the time that it took for your body to be prepared in natron salt and to be um, uh, sahufied. So, yes, there are many who argue that, in fact, we're talking about a Kemetic. Um, uh, ritual. In fact, even some of the early um, Christian writings say, don't do it because it's not ours. Okay, so, well, there it is. <laughs> yeah, another uh, important thing for us to acknowledge. So uh, our last question is, can you suggest someone that is reputable in the Medu Nature? Jabari, do you know someone who teaches the Medu Nature that's a reputable person that maybe is beginning a Medu Nature class shortly? I, I, I'm not sure. Obviously, it seems like um, MC Douglas hasn't seen the announcement, <laughs> but you should know that Anika, that Dr. Anika Daniels Osaze, Infraka Ma'at, is actually just about within the next two weeks, she's going to begin her Medu Nature class. And so, yes, I would suggest that you take the class with her. Um, go to Center for Ma'at, M-A-A-T, and you should see the announcement. It might actually also be on the Shrine of Ma'at page as well. But she's starting her class, and she's going to teach you the Meta Netter. So, um, Mick Douglas, I was teasing you a bit because Anika is the co-chief priest of the Shrine of Ma'at, and she teaches an intro Meta Netter class, and she's just like what Jabari said, 
is starting very soon. Mm -hmm. um, if you don't, so it's centerformaat.org. So center for N no centermaat.com, shrineofmaat.org. Oh, my bad. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> centerformaat.com. Right. Com. And um, shrineofmaat.org. But the centerformaat.com is where you want to go to um, take the Medu Natural class. I took the class. It's a very thorough class. You have quizzes and tests and stuff. And my suggestion is get a binder, get a notebook, do your best, stay on top of things, and then revisit it again. This, this Learning about us is not simple because we right. were complex, sophisticated. We, we, you know, at one point on the planet, it was just the divine and us. Ain't no telling what that actually looked like because none of us were here when that was happening. Right. And so when you come from people who build uh, Mercut, Mercuti, that is so complicated, people of today, today can't replicate it. Mm -hmm. You need to revisit what we did more than once to really get it thoroughly. Okay. So yep. centralmaat.com, if you have any questions, then you can hit us up in the DMs. Of, of shrine of my art dot on Facebook D direct message us on on Facebook and either I'll get it Jabari will get it or or Anika will get it yeah and uh, also I'd also like to to uh, let you know that I have my cash app up and just like Abu Waziri says we don't do this for money but we need money to do it your donations right. would be greatly appreciated and it's running running across the the, uh, the screen. And I'm gonna look at a few more comments. Um, and Sakina um, also says, yes, October 17th. That is when the class oh, is beginning. Oh, okay. Please join quickly because there are a lot of you that are waiting to the last moment. It's possible she may not even run the class if y'all don't join. And then you're gonna come on the day before and go, I wanna join. She'll be like, where were you? So I know that there are a lot of people who are waiting to the last minute. Why? <laughs> Why? Right. Yeah. Don't this wait. is the last minute. We're talking about a class that begins in less than two weeks. And the so after you learn it, I don't know if if they'll they'll be going to the Metropolitan Museum to to um, the the Egyptian wing, uh, but you you'll be able to read the Medu Nature. Yeah. And it's just it's just it's so awesome when you can do that because that unlocks your history. Yes. It unlocks your heritage. That's and right. You, you know what I'm saying? And when you go through the class, part of what, what we do here at the, in, um, with the Shrine of Ma'at, and one of the reasons why I have Tuesday Talk is so that we can begin to change our paradigm back to an African-centered paradigm. Mm -hmm. Okay? The paradigm is like the house you're in. The perspective is like the floor you're on, right? So if we're in the wrong house, you know, your perspective is kind of really null and void a little bit because you ain't even in the right structure, right? Right. So learning how to be in that space helps you out a lot is all I'm saying. You're going to love that class, really and truly. Yeah, you should definitely take it. Um, if you're interested in learning the comedic language, it's one of the best things you can do. And yes. I, I am nothing more than a beginner in reading. She is much more advanced, so she'll be able to really take you through it and help you mm -hmm. understand um, how it how it works. And I want to thank Sen Curtis. He hit up the cash app. Thank you very much. <laughs> so, Ntepi Jabari Osaze, thank you so much for coming on tonight. Guys, everyone in the audience, thank you so much for following the Shrine of Ma'at. And, 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 and being here with me every Tuesday for Tuesday Talk, I really appreciate it. And, um, and hopefully you guys are learning and taking notes. And even if you just come on and just, and just watch and absorb and ask questions and you know get your, answer, your questions answered and stuff, and then you go back and watch it and break it down, uh, it's very helpful. One of the things I did when I took uh, Dr. Anika's uh, Medinetra class was when I was in the class, I took the notes and then um, I went back and let's say the class was two hours. Let's just say that over the course of the week, I would study like 15 minutes of it. And you just make sure you get that chunk. You might, you don't necessarily have to do it that way, but breaking up a day's lesson over the week helps you to absorb it more. Just different ways to study and to absorb this and anything that you do because like i said it's it's very um 
it's it's complex, sophisticated stuff, but it's super dope, yo. It's dope. Like we are so dope. And when you get up in it, you don't want to leave. And thank you, um, Abu Ames. He hit up the cash app. Thank you very much. <laughs> yep, yep. I think I saw Abu Ames make a comment that I was gonna mention before, but um he did. I saw him too. Yeah, oh he said that Yafet Kota was across one was in um a, in the movie Across 110th Street, which is a reference, which is a reference to um, uh, 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 Harlem, because there are many who believe that once you cross 110th Street, you're in Harlem. And so that's what was being referred to. And Gaston Bryant says that Babu Infundishi wrote a book on Mentio Tap. Yes, he did. He did, he wrote two. Yeah, so um, these are all, no, it's just one on Mentio Tap. What's the other one? Huh? Who's the other one on? He wrote a, a book about um, martial arts as well. And there was two. He wrote three there books. He wrote Divine Warrior. He wrote um he wrote three books, but only one on Mental Hotel. Okay. Yeah. So that's why um, Divine Warriors are healers, right? Right. 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 I'm wrong. Right. So okay. so know that um this is an important topic. Um uh the, the four areas are also covered in my book. So I want you to recognize that. As this goes, there's a lot more study to do. And as you study more, you're going to learn more about how your ancestors actually ascended to the top of human civilization. We need to learn more about that so we're able to go forward. So oh. here is Jabari's, sorry guys, I'm trying to get this. There we go. Here's Jabari's book, Seven Little White Lies. This book is has the seven chapters of each little white lie. Mm -hmm. And I want to tell you, you could be eight or 88 and read this book because it's simply written, but it's sophisticated. And just like you understand Jabari when he's talking, that's how he writes. It's very easy to grasp these very mm -hmm. important concepts. So go ahead and get this book, all right? And the next time you see him, bring it and he will autograph it. Out. Can you see that? Boom. Mm -hmm. You know how there's Manu Nature? Okay, and this is uh, Baba Infudishi's book. Yep. There we go, Very boom. Dramatic. Okay, and um, for those of you who are in Harlem, he's on, what street's he on, 125th, 125th? 135th. Well, sometimes, sometimes he has a table on 125th. Right, sometimes he's a table yeah. on 125th, and he'll, he'll um, you can get the book from him there, I guess. I don't have a Baba Infudishi's info on I do. the top. You have it. Yeah, I'm not, I wouldn't share it here just because I I don't know. If no, you, not not you know, to sh but. not personal. I'm saying right. like where his how you could get a hold of him. If right. you wanted to get a hold of him and get the book, you can also DM us and we'll we'll direct That's you right. quickly from there. That's right. That. Do I, do okay. I, do I. Yep. Yes. Yes. Okay, guys. So Jabari's coming back in roughly in about a month, and we're gonna have part three. So I want to thank everybody for coming in tonight. And it's a little late on the East Coast, but that's okay, because we got our message for tonight from the good pastor. I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> so um, once again, I really, truly appreciate your support, and we will see you guys next Tuesday. Shemem Ma'at, go forth in peace. Uh, go forth in balance. Shemem Ma'at, family. See you soon. Jabari, why did you leave? <laughs>